meeting to order on May 14th, 2019. Welcome, everyone. We love to see a crowd mm -hmm. in the audience. Mm -hmm. it's great. Thank you all so much for being here. We have a lot of great stuff to do tonight and some business to get to. And we're going to start by calling the roll, please. Commissioner Abraham. Present. Commissioner McElroy. Present. Commissioner Watkins. Present. Commissioner Wilson. Present. Mayor Harless. Present. And Commissioner McElroy, would you lead us in the invocation tonight? Please stand with us. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, it is with grateful hearts that we come to you asking that your wisdom, your love, your respect, your kindness, your compassion be reflected in all that we do and say. Our desire is to take care of the citizens of this community in a way that honors you, that honors your name, that makes each person feel meaningful and dignified. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. And we ask your forgiveness when we take them for granted because we know many are not this fortunate. We pray our business will be conducted in a way that is orderly, that honors you, and that is the very best that we have to offer this community. Thank you for those that are gathered here. We pray a special blessing on the child that we're recognizing tonight for healing, for peace, for compassion, for comfort for this family. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please stay standing and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to its republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. You may be seated. City Manager, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I do have two additions. One is a uh, be a uh, introduction of an ordinance to amend Chapter 58 to the uh, in reference to the Kentucky Religious Freedom Restoration Act, being brought forth uh, by Mayor Harless. The second addition I have is also a motion to amend Chapter 58, uh, being brought forth by Commissioner Abraham. Thank you very much. Those will both be for introduction, Madam Mayor. Okay, great. We'll put it in that appropriate spot. All right, so tonight we're going to have our assistant city manager, Michelle Smolin, come up, and we have a very special celebration for our 2019 Citizens Academy. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will actually turn it over to uh, city manager Jim Art to kick us off. Uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, yes. Shut your hand off. <laughs> thank, thank you, Michelle. I just want to say that this was the, uh, the first time that I was able to see the uh, uh, the uh, class in action. And uh, I was talking to Michelle about this. A lot of communities do not do this. This is not a, uh, a very popular thing across the nation. I'm glad that uh, uh, the uh, uh, team here in Paducah had the foresight to bring this to bear uh, three years ago now. This is the completion of the third class. And, and I think there was a, uh, a lot of uh, interaction with the class. And uh, we did have a, uh, a debrief, if you will, lessons learned, uh, follow up session with the uh, class tonight. And took about an hour to get through. And there's a lot of uh, good things that the class learned. And, and we learned also from the class, which is fantastic the sharing of information and knowledge. And we also uh, prepped the, uh, the, the graduating class, number three with opportunities to uh, get more involved uh, there was some lively discussion about how to do that and also some interest uh, by one draftee and one volunteer to serve <laughs> to serve on the uh, the multicultural uh, festival that's coming up in Paducah which I thought was a fantastic thing and there's my draftee right there you can wave there she is yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it was, it's been a uh, it was fun for me to see him in action also I thought it was great too to get out there to the classes I was at just a few uh, to see the departments in action and see the passion and that was actually brought up by the uh, graduates here tonight that all the passion that the uh, uh, team Paducah puts out there and the employees and how they they enjoy working with one another and they really are passionate about what they do so it's neat to be able to uh, have that reflected back to us uh, from the uh, members of this class and with that I'll give uh, kudos to all of the uh, department heads leadership team and department members that were involved this year for class number three and also give a big thanks to Michelle for leading this uh, this operation I know she says it's her favorite thing to do <laughs> And I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Well, um, Mayor and Commissioner, I'm very happy to be here uh, on this graduation night. As City Manager mentioned, this is our third class. This year we had 21 participants. And for all of you out there, this is a recruitment. We want you next year. Please come take it to all of our audience members. Uh, we spend eight Thursdays with the various departments getting a behind-the-scenes look at their operations, 
Um, the other thing that we really want to promote is two-way conversation. So they're informal, not death by PowerPoint. That's our goal. And uh, we want feedback. So we have very open and honest conversations about what's going on in the city. Uh, we also really hope to make the city approachable and put a face to city government so that this group knows who to come to when they have something that they need assistance with. Uh, finally, we hope that they become our ambassadors and go out and talk about what the city is doing and encourage others to get involved. So this was a very lively crew. I just wanted to share a few comments um, before we invite them up. So one person said that they appreciated the behind the scenes look and that the city workers are made of passion and grit. Isn't that great? Um, that someone also said that they lived there their whole life and they had no idea that the city did all of these things. And finally, we had one really touching moment where someone needed some emergency assistance and when they were visiting our 911 center, they met one of the dispatchers that helped dispatch the call. So there were some really neat moments. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also want to give a big shout out to the department heads. You know, I help organize it, but they really do the work. So I uh, really appreciate the effort they put into it. So before we call all of them up, um, I didn't know if the commissioners had anything they wanted to say to the class. I want to pre uh, say thank you for including us this year. It's the first time we have been included. And the, those in the class remember, of course, it was the night of Murray State's game. <laughs> and then <laughs> so I was rushing over here. And I know I talked 90 to nothing when I sat down to visit with you. But congratulations again. And I, I'm glad we had that opportunity to spend some time with all of you. So congratulations. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, and, and just thank you. I, I think let's give a round of applause to the department heads. They definitely yeah. deserve that. Thank you all so much for leaning in and participating in this program. And thank you to the graduates. Congratulations again. Uh, I heard that there was some um, boards and commissions oh, yeah. passed out today and lots of ways to get engaged. And oftentimes I don't think it's obvious how to get engaged with city government. City government feels very far away from us sometimes. Yeah. But what a great program for us as a community to learn how we do impact how city government functions. And it's important to understand that. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Yeah. I had it. Um, I was just going to say, I'm a graduate of That's class right. number two, oh, yeah. so get involved, get involved, get involved. I had an opportunity to talk to the class uh, right before the last, uh, the last department and uh, talked about how uh, Michelle used the word ambassadors, now you are ambassadors to the program. Um, uh, talked about how the information that you learned during the Citizens Academy, you used the next day. I mean, uh, whether it's uh, a water cooler talk or someone has an opinion on how the street department works, or what? well, you have information now. And that's how you make decisions. You get information, accurate information, and then you, uh, you share it. So uh, congratulations to you guys. I'd just like to say that I appreciate your involvement and concern and interest in city government and the city of Paducah. It's a great place to live. We all love it or we wouldn't be here. And, and I would say at the local level, you know, I've served in the state legislature six years and here uh, now my uh, seventh year, and uh, you can have a greater impact on people's lives when it comes to job opportunities, educational opportunities, and, and other things at the local level, much more so than you can at the state level or other levels higher on up. So uh, it's a great level to be involved in, and we just appreciate your interest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is uh, call them up, have them shake the commissioner's hand, and then we'll take a picture at the end all together. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is alphabetical. Not, we have Kim Arndt. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Muhammad? <laughs> Muhammad, do you want to come on up? Congratulations. Glad you did that. Congratulations. All right, we have Arthur Congratulations. Boinkin. Congratulations. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Laura Bray. So glad you did this. Yeah. Hey, glad you did this. AJ Collins. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. And you're all here. Yes. Thank you. It's great to have you. You're welcome. Really glad you did. Nice nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Hello, uh, Brooke Davis. Congratulations yes. again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely <laughs> good. Hey, congratulations. You too. Dana. Yes. Tell me your name again. Thank you. Oh, yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, hey, good. Oh, we have Brian Four. Come on up. 
Congrats. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Dana. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your new volunteer gig. <laughs> <laughs> we have a David and Yvonne Grace. They come as they come as a pair, right? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing this. Congratulations. Good, good. Congratulations. We have Mary. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Really glad you came. Thank you very much. Good to see you guys. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Jim? My name's Cool Audio. Come on up. Yeah, that's right. Congratulations. Thank you all very much. <laughs> we have Michael Steele. Come on up. Yes, to meet you too. The blood sugar's low, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, neighbor. Congratulations. Uh, we have Hi. Debbie. Congratulations, Thank sir. You. Proud of you. <laughs> Leaning in. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kay, if you want to come on up. I'm glad you did this. Thank you. I'm just going to grab your hand. Thank you so much. I think that's it. Bailey, come on up. Yeah, yeah I'm glad Bailey. you did it. It's great, isn't it? It's really yeah, learned a lot. It. That shirt looks good on you. Oh, <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Yeah. You guys want to kind of infill over here in front of the dais? Thank you, Mr. You want to come down to the Mad American National You guys try to mm -hmm. back fill around? Where are you going? Go you break yourself around? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Say class number three. Yes, I have one for you. Yes, I have one for you. Yes, I have one for you. How fun. All right, if you're watching on TV or if you're in the audience and you're interested, uh, this class starts sometime in the early spring, like late winter, early spring, so keep an eye out for next year. And our police academy, our Citizens Police Academy, is in the fall. Is that correct? All right. So keep an eye out if you want to participate. All right, next up I'm going to ask, um, we're going to do a very important proclamation tonight. I'm going to ask Chris, Brittany, Brielle, Cheyenne, Caden to come to... The front podium, please. So we have a proclamation tonight, and I'm going to read this, and if you want to say a few words, then I'll bring it over, and you can have this. How about that? All right. Whereas the Children's Tumor Foundation is observing May 17th, 2019 as World Neurofibromatosis Awareness Day to educate the public about this rare genetic disorder. And whereas, although over 2 million people around the world are living with NF, and one in every 3,000 births is diagnosed with NF, it is still relatively unknown to the public. And whereas NF affects all populations equally, regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender, and whereas NF causes tumors to grow on nerves throughout the body and also cannot or can affect development of the brain, cardiovascular system, bones, and skin, and whereas the disorder can lead to blindness, deafness, bone abnormalities, disfigurement, learning disabilities, disabling pain, and cancer. And whereas the Children's Tumor Foundation leads efforts to promote and financially sponsor world-class medical research aimed at finding effective treatments and ultimately a cure for NF, 
And whereas the, tumor, the Children's Tumor Foundation is actively fostering collaborative partnerships in both science and industry to speed the drug research and development process through a number of consortia called Synodos. And whereas much remains to be done in raising public awareness of NF to help promote early diagnosis, proper management and treatment, prevention of complications, and support for research. Now, therefore, I, Brandy Harless, Mayor of Paducah, Kentucky, in recognition of this important initiative, do hereby proclaim May 17th, 2019, as World Neurofibromatosis Awareness Day in our city and recognize Caden George as Paducah's NF1 hero. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for bringing this to our attention. I just want to thank um, Mayor Harless and Lindsay Birdsong for all their hard work to make this happen. When Caden was diagnosed at 18 months, we had little to no knowledge of what this condition was or what his journey was going to look like. And so I'm overcome with emotions right now because if we can help one person to find early detection, if we can help one person to know what NF1 is, um, their, their life can be so much easier with early detection and with monitoring. Caden goes into a geneticist and a neurologist and an ophthalmologist once a year for annual appointments, and they're hoping that with constant early screening that they can help him make his life easier. And they really don't know like what each person's <clears throat> journey will be. He might have nothing. 15% um, of the people that are diagnosed with NF1 have complications and have tumors. And, um, but the, re the majority of people, they find out that they have it because their child is diagnosed with it. And so it's important to be educated and to know what this condition is. So thank you so much for all of your hard work to make this happen. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have a presentation and the introduction of some new officers. Uh, Chief Laird. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. If I can have uh, new employees come forward. I introduce to you tonight three new employees of the police department. We have McCall Buckingham. She's our newest telecommunicator. She's originally from the Fulton County area. Graduated from the Kentucky Telecommunications Academy in 2015. And uh, she has, uh, she's an experienced dispatcher. She's been doing it for several years now. And uh, most recently, she worked for the Metro Nashville area as well as the Kentucky State Police. So uh, she came on board uh, late last month. We also have Matthew York. He is a uh, Benton native, uh, US Army Sergeant. Um, he worked for six years with the Bryan, Texas Police Department. And um, he is a lateral uh, officer, which means he doesn't have to go to the academy. Uh, same thing with McCall. She doesn't have to go uh, to the academy. They're already trained and, um, and ready to go. And then we also have Carlos Curley Jr. He is a Southern Illinois native, and he has over 30 years of law enforcement experience. Uh, most recently, he served 17 years with the Springfield, Missouri Police Department. And uh, he is also a certified officer and uh, brings a good amount of experience to us as well. Uh, so we're extremely pleased to, to have them here and present them to you tonight. Great. Welcome to the team. You guys want to come around and, and shake hands and say hi? And uh, you can see they're already in uniform. They're already working. Wow. And um, Welcome. they were sworn in at an earlier date and time. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Welcome, Welcome to the team. We're happy to have you guys. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the special guests just keep coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to add some more to the to the table. So next up, we do have a special guest. Uh, I guess we could call her famous now. Um, as of about a year ago, I don't think that she was actually famous, and now she officially is famous. I'm going to ask Sarah Bradley and her mom to come to the podium. If you don't know, Sarah Bradley was recently on Bravo's Top Chef as the Kentucky representative. <laughs> 
came home. She came home from Top Chef and decided to have a baby. So any moment now, we might witness. I will try to not have the baby here at the city council meeting. Um, you know, I just I think it's really interesting to say there was a moment where I was trying to decide if I wanted to go on Top Chef or not. They contacted me and said we'd really like for you to try out. Um, a lot of the other chefs that were they were looking at were from the Lexington, the Louisville, the Cincinnati area. There were not a lot of people from outside of that region. And you know, I asked my mother, I asked my father, my husband, what should I do? And my mother said, Sarah, it is your civic duty. <laughs> <laughs> no, verbatim, she said, she said, it is your civic duty. Think about how much credit, how many, how many times you can say Paducah, mm -hmm. and and on a national stage, and you don't get that, you know, you don't get that opportunity often. So I went through the process. They picked me, and I got to say Paducah like I don't know how many hundreds of times maybe on. I said it like every moment I had available. But a, really, a driving force behind me going is a lot of what I've learned from our city CVB. A lot of what I've learned from being involved with the uh, PHA, the Paducah Hospitality Association, and that it wasn't just to benefit myself, but it was to benefit my employees. Employees. My servers make better money. My cooks are guaranteed hours. When they're coming to town to people to eat at the restaurant, and we have people from all over the country traveling to Paducah to eat at the restaurant, they're staying at hotels here. They're buying gas here. They're doing those things. And so it was my motivating factor when I was there was not just for myself. I mean, yeah, you know, the, the money that you can possibly win is really nice, but it was also motivating that I knew I was representing my city. So I just want to thank you all for making this place such a wonderful place to represent because, you know, without you guys and you guys, you know, we, we need each other to support each other. And, mm -hmm. and I think I've gotten to show everybody on a national level that Paducah really is mm -hmm. something. That's something we do here. So thanks, y'all. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for representing us. If you saw the last couple of episodes, you actually got to see Bev on TV. She also became famous overnight. Um, I cried. I did too. I cried every episode, actually. That, when, when they introduced you, it was like, oh. <laughs> it, was well, awesome. it, was, it was one year ago today that they drove down, they sent a car down. From to, They sent a car and they took me on a car because they were going to fly me to Louisville. And I said, you guys, that's like... I'm gonna have to go from Paducah to Chicago. Yeah. So like it was this whole it was gonna take like a day and a half to get to Louisville and I said, just you know, I'll drive up there and that was totally not gonna happen. So they sent a car and so it was one year ago today that I got picked up in my front porch, like picked up at my house at like five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I forgot about half of the stuff that I was gonna take. Yeah. And so I went in really nervous, but it turned out well. So, awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You so we much. really yeah. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. And items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted by one motion and one vote. There will be no separate discussion uh, of these items unless a board member so requests. Does anyone have anything they'd like to remove tonight? No? All right, I'm going to ask Ms. Claudia Meeks to read the items recommended for approval, please. Minutes for the April 23rd, 2019 City Commission meeting. Receive and file documents. Reappointment of Derwin Ursery to the Paducah Area Transit System Board. This term shall expire June 30th, 2022. Reappointment of Carol Young to the Nuisance Code Enforcement Board. This term shall expire February 26th, 2022. Appointment of Kristen Williams to the Paducah McCracken County Convention and Visitors Bureau to fill the unexpired term of Jay Page, who has resigned. This term shall expire December 31, 2021. Personnel actions, a municipal order authorizing the planning department to apply for an online grant through the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation grant portal to request $10,340 for the fire department to purchase public education and engagement supplies. A municipal order authorizing the City of Paducah Planning Department to apply for a 2019 U.S. Bulletproof Vest Partnership Grant in an amount of $6,752 through the U.S. Department of Justice for use by the Police Department. 
a municipal order authorizing the mayor to execute a grant application and all documents necessary through the U.S. Department of Homeland Security for a 2019 port security grant in the amount of $50,250 for the Paducah Police Department for the purchase of a commercial drone with related software, equipment, and training and authorizing the planning department to submit such grant through the online web portal, a municipal order approving an application and all documents necessary for the City of Paducah Planning Department in partnership with the Paducah Art House Alliance, <coughs> PAHA, to apply for a Linda and Jerry Bruckheimer Preservation Fund for Kentucky Grant in an amount of $10,000 for the Columbia Theater Roof Restoration and a municipal order ratifying the mayor's execution of a Tennessee Riverline Partnership Agreement with the McCracken County Fiscal Court and the Tennessee Riverline in order to fulfill the task associated with the pilot community program. I make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Thank you. Can you call roll, please? Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner McElroy? Aye. Commissioner Watkins? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Harless? Aye. All right, moving on to some municipal orders. And I don't have any assignments on these, so. I have oh, mine. I'm looking for it. Oh, great, thank you, I do now. Commissioner Wilson. <coughs> Can I steal yours for a minute? Okay, thanks. I'll take yours. Actually, I I, got notes I move that a municipal order entitled a municipal order authorizing and directing the finance director to transfer funds from the commission reserve fund to the Kresge demolition project account in amount of $150,000 for emergency demolition of the Kresge building be adopted. Second. Jim. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. This is basically to finish out the uh, Kresge project. We have uh, money set aside in the budget. This actually allows us to utilize it and move it from the uh, commission contingency into the project account. Uh, basically, what we need to do now is stabilize the uh, uh, the ground, of course, as well as the uh, Jay Campbell side of the uh, of the downtown buildings there. Uh, we're hoping we'll be able to finish this out with what we have budgeted. Of course, we do have this also in the FY20 budget and in the capital improvements plan because we do anticipate some carryover. Any questions, discussion? All right, if you'll call roll, please. Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner McElroy? Aye. Commissioner Watkins? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Harless? <coughs> Aye. And Commissioner Watkins? I move that a municipal order entitled a municipal order authorizing the city manager to make a monetary contribution for economic development to Sprocket, Inc. in the amount of $150,000 to be used as local matching funds for the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development's Innovation Office Regional Innovation for Startups, uh, Startups and Entrepreneurs RISE program be adopted. Second. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Th this again is uh, money that's coming out of the, we were hoping to transfer out of the, uh, I guess use it out of the investment fund uh, to serve as matching money uh, for uh, Sprocket as they attempt to bring more money in from the state. They have a $1.1 million project planned and they're attempting to raise 600,000 in local match. It's a dollar for dollar grant program. I think, I believe this is gonna be a wonderful program for us. We actually have this money as, as an economic development set aside within the investment fund and we do have this, this 150,000, but after we spend this, we'll just have a few thousand left to go in the fiscal year. Next year, however, in the budget, we do have some more money set aside for economic development purposes. Great, any questions, discussion? Just, um, it's we have a, like a week of school left and summer's out, uh, summer's, school's out and summer starts, so this is, this is field trip time and uh, we took our class to Sprocket on mm -hmm. yesterday. And so I have a really good chance to to see what they do, and that's that's another level of thinking right there. Um, <laughs> did you make anything? Uh, uh, no, I did not. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's it's just very interesting how you send a message to from the computer to the printer, and it prints it out in 3D. Uh, so the guys made keychains, uh, and it was it was really cool. Uh, but it's uh, that's uh, that's the next level. That's the next level stuff. So. Um, um, they will use that money. Uh, they were excited that that, that were that they're getting it, 
Uh, but our guys were excited. They were like in awe of what was going on. Mm. And uh, so that was, that was pleasing to me. Um, but that's, it's, a, it's a good outfit. And the guys that, that run it, is, uh, they're good guys. That's awesome you got to experience Yeah, that. yeah. That's cool. It's next level. I like that term, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. All right. Is this, uh, any other discussion? Questions? Comments? No? All right. Call roll, please. Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner McElroy? Aye. Commissioner Watkins? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Harless? Aye. All right. Next up, this is where we are adding um, the items that Jim mentioned. So we have two introductions tonight. I'll make the first one. Um, I hereby move that Chapter 58 of the Code of Ordinances titled Human Relations of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, be amended to include the following as Section 58-133, titled Enforcement Consistent with Kentucky Religious Freedom <laughs> Restoration Act. It is the intent of the City Commission that all sections of this ordinance shall be interpreted in a manner consistent with KRS 446.350, which provides as follows. Government shall not substantially burden a, freedom's, a person's freedom of religion, the right to act or refuse to act in a manner motivated by a sincerely held religious belief may not be substantially burdened unless the government proves by clear and convincing evidence that it has a compelling government interest in infringing the specific act or refusal to act and has used the least restrictive means to further that interest. A burden shall include indirect burdens such as withholding benefits, assessing penalties, or an exclusion from programs or access to facilities. You need a second. second. Please. Thank you very much. Um, well, I have a, a statement. I, I rarely actually write out statements, but I gave this a lot of thought today. Um, so I'm going to read that to you if you guys don't mind, and we can open it up for discussion. Um, when I supported the human relations ordinance change last year, I was ensured that the state law protected all of our citizens from government overreach regarding this issue. However, I have heard concerns from my fellow commissioners regarding this issue, and in an effort to protect all people and make sure that our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted, I am bringing forward this ordinance tonight. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act, passed by our state legislature, um, not once, but twice, during Governor Bashir's term in 2013, the legislature passed this bill, but the governor vetoed it. The legislature then overruled his veto, and the legislation became a law. Groups like the Kentucky Baptist Convention, the Catholic Conference of Kentucky, and the Family Foundation of All, uh, all supported this legislation. And at the time, there were some interesting statements I wanted to share with you all. Paul Chitwood, executive director then, in 2013, of the Kentucky Baptist Convention, stated in an article on the Baptist Press website, this important law will protect the rights of people of, of faith in Kentucky. Religious freedom was a good deal when Kentucky became the 15th state of the Union on June 1, 1792. It still is. I praise God for this victory. And an excerpt from the Catholic Conference of Kentucky's blog states the RFRA laws help to strike a balance between protecting religious liberty and, in, and addressing claims of unjust discrimination. They ensure that the government has a compelling interest before forcing anyone to violate their religious beliefs. In effect, this means that the government cannot sanction laws and actions which punish those who hold views that others simply find objectionable. Instead, the state or local government must prove that it is advancing an important government interest. Not only is this approach in accord with the Catholic view of religious liberty, but it also reflects a deeply American value. Thomas Jefferson summed this principle up well by writing that no provision in our Constitution ought to be dearer to man than that which protects the rights of conscience against the enterprises of the civil authority. This, continuing the statement from the blog, this should be a value that all Americans cherish. It is striking that most of the debates seem to take for granted that those individuals living a homosexual lifestyle do not value religious liberty. Yet over 50% of gays and lesbians describe themselves as being religiously affiliated. Hence, it should not be insinuated that only those adhering to a traditional view of sexuality value the liberty to act according to their deeply held beliefs. If our goal in the City Commission is to truly protect our citizens, I can't think of a better way to do it than through this amendment. Is there any discussion at this time? I would just say that religious liberties are really important to me, 
And I think when we think about one another, we have to think about respect and kindness and understanding. And just because we disagree about things, our religious beliefs, doesn't mean we don't like one another or don't care about one another. Um, we can still be compassionate and care from people and disagree. And I don't know about you, but that happens in my family. So <laughs> anyway, I'm interested very much in religious liberties and an amendment to protect our citizens on the local level since we have other ordinances on the local level. Let's face it, we live and breathe and do life on the local level. And if we have to leave the local level, it's more expensive, it's more intrusive into our life. And so I'd like to see us do this. I know uh, Commissioner Abraham is also bringing an amendment. Um, so we have two amendments on the same subject. So I'm not sure what the best way to do that. Uh, I personally would like more time to study the issue and talk with, I've got a couple of attorneys that are religious liberties um, experts, and I'd like to, them to weigh in. Uh, so I don't know if we need to table both of them. Uh, somebody that's more experienced maybe needs to tell me. But I'm very, very interested and excited that we're at this point. Uh, providing this protection at the local level. We've got it at the state, but I think it's important to bring it to the local level. I'd like to make a statement, if good, please. <clears throat> I want everyone to uh, understand that we're not uh, going to repeal the fairness ordinance that was passed by the previous commission. Um, we're not going to do anything to it. We're, I think all five of us, I could, uh, could speak for, our intent on keeping those protections in place. Uh, to make sure that everyone uh, has an opportunity to, to not be discriminated against and have some recourse. Uh, what we are uh, interested in doing is uh, amending the Fairness Ordinance, leaving it just like it is, not repealing anything, amending it with a religious liberty uh, clause to protect business owners and others who have deeply held religious beliefs uh, from being discriminated against to bring some balance, as the U.S. Supreme Court said was required in their ruling uh, not too long ago in uh, out of Colorado. Uh, the question, as Commissioner McElroy said, is uh, which is the best way to go forward? Both of them are good proposals. Um, I would say, and, and I uh, did a little uh, research to remember uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that the mayor just uh, read uh, in 2013 when governor, the governor vetoed, Bashir vetoed that bill. I spoke on the House floor urging the body to override the governor's veto, and we did, and I was very proud of the House, and I, and I was proud of my vote, too, to vote for uh, this piece of legislation to protect our religious liberties. So it's a good, strong piece of legislation, but uh, I'd like to see us uh, discuss it more and reach a, a unanimous consensus on which way to go forward. Both of them are good proposals. They both protect our religious liberties. And uh, so, uh, you know, I just I want a little more time for us to reach a, a, a unanimous consent on which way we want to go forward. But both of them are good proposals, and I do think we need to protect our religious liberties, so I will support one of them. Thank you. So one of them we're more familiar with. Um, I went back through, well, first of all, I didn't know this was going to be brought up tonight until I received an email from you last night from Commissioner Abraham, I think at 8, 822, that you plan to bring this up tonight. So that's less than 24 hours notice of something that's going to be coming up. I did go quickly pull out some of my notes from uh, the city attorney that he had given me back a year, a year 15 months ago on the same issue, and it is exactly what you have introduced tonight. It is a state statute. Uh, state, uh, according to all of his notes that night, if you go back and look, uh, I wish he could have been here tonight, um, city attorney D Dave Denton. He talked about the state statute provides all of that protection. And I think it was our intent for that to be clearly stated in the in the ordinance. Perhaps it wasn't as clear as we want. Uh, you've said the intent was for that to be in there uh, as you've read it. So I think that we need to to do that. I did not see your uh, version until 4:52 this afternoon. So I really haven't had any chance to look at it. The. Um uh, the wording that uh, that I wanted to bring uh, as an amendment was pretty much the same wording that uh, was brought in 2018. And here's here's the uh, the problem I see with this one. Uh, 
the government shall not substantially burden it. Define that. What does that mean? The government may think that what they're doing is not substantially burdening. Me. I may think differently. Um, I think it gets it gets uh, it, it gets kind of muddled. What I asked for was one sentence. Was one sentence, and it was it was voted. It wasn't approved, uh, and I asked the city attorney at the time. So if we bring this, if we bring this, if I bring this this wording, is it gonna? What's it gonna do? Is it gonna cancel out? Uh, anyone's rights, or is it going to? No, it's not. So when we talk about added language, he pretty much said, "Well, you don't really need that language. Why is that? Because the individual is already protected." So my response to that was, "Well, we really doesn't need this language because the Constitution protects everybody in the House." Well, uh, the majority of the commission felt differently, and they voted against that. And I haven't changed. I haven't changed my uh, my opinion on that. Now I haven't uh, been out campaigning about that, uh, but it hasn't gone away. I think it's very important that the majority of the people that live in this city uh, feels that uh, if we're going to be adding language to an ordinance uh, that double protects one group, then let's add this language. Uh, that that one sentence uh, that I propose uh, now that's comparable language. The folks will say, "Well, you don't need it." Okay, well, why do we need why do we need the the language uh, identified in certain groups? Because the majority of these people that live in the city, we are a loving community, and no one uh, would sit stand, sit here and applaud anyone being discriminated against based on whatever based on their gender, based on their color, based on their lifestyle, the way they think, we wouldn't do that, would we? Of course not. So, so, but if we're gonna add that, if we're gonna add that language, having said what I just said, then okay, then let's add the language that no person or no business, private business owner or individual can be forced to participate in any activity that goes against their deeply held religious beliefs. I believe that's what the city attorney said many times that night, that they, that state statute protected that. One of my point is, you sent it out at 822 last night. And I guess expecting us to be informed about it today, and that's really not that much notice. Well, we'll talk about that when it's on the yeah, table, that's okay, because that's a different amendment. A different amendment, yeah, but it's yeah, both yeah. They're related yeah. to the same. They are related to the same. Yep. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. Okay. Um, How can we um, hear both amendments and we're work? about to move on to okay. the next one? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Thank you. That's great. That's All right. Great. Any other discussion on this one? Nope. No. All right, Commissioner Abraham. I hereby move that Chapter 58 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, be amended to include the following as Section. 58-133, a private business owner sh shall not be forced to violate his or her sincerely held religious beliefs be adopted. Second. Great. Discussion? I think um, from my perspective, um, Commissioner Wilson mentioned getting an email at eight o'clock last night and um, having to prepare for um, this being brought forth today. I, I would say that uh, I think it's really important for us to make sure that as elected leaders, while we definitely hear um, our community, we are the filters of fact, we're the filters of um, knowledge, and it's our responsibility as leaders to make sure that we are telling our citizens um, and giving them pathways that make sense. My concern, and the reason I brought forward, and I sent this to you earlier today, mm -hmm. the motion I was gonna bring forward. My concern is that by creating our local, our own local language, as you are proposing here, um, we are actually providing a true pathway for our community. And the reason is, because when the rubber meets the road, and these things have to be brought into court. It's really important that 
there's case law, that there's precedent, that there are um, examples of other cases that have been brought forward according to certain legal language. My fear is that this actually doesn't get you the goal that you're looking for. That this doesn't have precedent, but that state law has a conversation happening around it, that the state law is being challenged, and that creates precedent in the system so that then if there, were, there was ever any question on a local level, if someone was being forced to participate in an action that was against their liberties, there would be an answer to that. I'm afraid that we're creating our own court system with your amendment, that when this comes to be challenged, that there is not gonna be a higher power, a higher law to refer to. And so I, I just don't think it's accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. I actually put together that, um, that amendment that I just um, presented because I am trying to get us to the goal that we're trying to get to. And I don't, I'm not saying I'm, that I am any smarter or better but I think it actually gets us to the goal that you're trying to go after in, pr in probably a more protective and robust way. So that's, that's where I am on, on this one. Well, I'm not trying to put words in uh, Dave Denton's mouth, but I do have him as quoted as saying, the city has no power to diminish the state law. And the state law is extremely strong in this protection area. So I guess that's why First of all, I caught me off guard to get that late last night to prepare for today's meeting for discussion. But those are the things that he said. So I, I think it would be important that we talk to him in perhaps in more detail. It looks like you all did talk about it at the state legislature. You felt strongly enough about it to override the governor's veto and to keep that in place. So it seems to me that that is the language that's been accepted across the entire state of Kentucky, enacted by our state legislature. Yeah, we had hearings before a committee that passed, uh, I think it was unanimously, and then it went to the House floor and the Senate, and both passed with a, a very large margin. The governor vetoed the bill, and then we overrode. Uh, so, and with all the groups, I think you mentioned uh, the uh, Catholic Conference, of Kentucky, the uh, Kentucky uh, Family Foundation, and and uh, there's three major religious groups. The Catholic, the Catholic, Catholic Conference, Conference mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky Family Foundation, and then what's the other one? The Baptist. Uh, uh, yeah, Kentucky Baptist Association. So all the major religious groups supported it, and we overrode with a big, uh, big majority. Yeah. So the the original amendment that we brought back in. 2018. The original ordinance? The original amendment to the ordinance by adding language. Prior to that, what was the uh, what was the state's position on that? And we added language to an already ordinance. To my knowledge, the state language was the same. It, yeah, it passed in 2013. The, it's called the it's called the Kentucky Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That, that Commissioner Watkins is talking about having voted for. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh. I'm talking about we added language to our human rights uh, uh, ordinance to include specific, we had specific people, persons, mm -hmm. right? What was the state's, where was the state on that particular issue? Did we, did we, did, were we challenging that? Are you talking about the state statute that protects certain classes of people? Yeah. Oh, okay. Were, I, I don't have it in front of me. I'm were, not, were we, were we challenging that? This, were those uh, were, were the groups that we amended to that to that ordinance? Were they included in the the state uh, legislative? Was it were they covered? What were those folks already covered? I. I'm not going to quote him, but I'm, in the Constitution, uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's my understanding, he said, in that area, we did have the right to do that on a local basis. The state had not taken a position on that, and our ordinance simply demonstrated equality for all citizens. And then that night, he addressed it as far as businesses from the state statute. So I think those are questions that you would need to ask on a legal uh, ruling, which is which is why. I, I think that we need more information. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure. I have no problem with that. 
Uh, but here's what I'm, I want to make this statement. Um, you said that you wanted to make sure that we were inclusive with the addict language of those specific groups to make sure we weren't. I didn't say that. Well, what did you say? I'm sorry. I'm not sure what you're asking. <laughs> I'm asking you, why did we add that language? Back in 2018? Yeah, why did we add that, those specific people, that group of folks? Why did we add that? To My understanding, Mayor, that they had not been, they were not included at that point in our, including age. Right. We You'll remember added. age discrimination. Right. Is not, so we added Age those. is not a part of the state statute either, supposedly, but I haven't found that. So I'm not, for, I'm not comfortable talking about that without having that in front of me. And I'm trying to find it in the well, ordinance. Well, I know, I, I know this. I know prior to we added uh, certain groups of people to that human rights ordinance. We did. They weren't there before. But, but apparently we felt that it was important to add those folks. And to, we had, to and we had the, the right to do that. To, we had a right to do that. And what I'm saying is, I really feel that the majority of the people that live in this city feels that we have the right to add the language that I'm talking about. No one's arguing with you that we don't have yeah. the right to do it. It's no the way to do it, what to do it, how to do it, what, what we're going to add. The, what language is the, what we're debating, right? The, which language? Well, I tried to keep it pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You did. Um, I think the state, any state ordinance is not as simple but I think that you have to take into consideration what the state has enacted. Yeah, well, what you just I, said, what you just said, Commissioner, this, um, this here, the, the uh, motion to amend the chapter 58, what the, the, I think the mayor, you sent this, did you send this out? I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the government shall not substantially burden. When you start talking about understanding exactly what, what that means, I'm not a lawyer, so, that's why we have a court system. I'll hire a lawyer and he can figure that out. But on the local level, I want to make sure that since we're adding language to an ordinance already established, then, okay, so is that double protection? Because individuals are, to discriminate against someone is against the law. You can't do that. Everybody understands that. Everybody raise their hand and say, no, you can't do it. Okay, so why are we adding this? Well, well, we add in it because we want to be fair. Okay, let's be fair then. Let's add the other language just to make sure that we have everything covered. Those I think it's all, comparable. I think it's comparable language. Those are all good questions that I feel like we could have addressed from a, an attorney. I don't think sending it out at last night, evidently, and adding it in today without being published on the agenda gives any opportunity for public comment or for the attorney to be here to address it. Those are really my major points. I would I, have to reread, but the U.S. Supreme Court's decision uh, a few months ago concerning the cake uh, baker in Colorado case, uh, the uh, Justice, I think it's John Paul Stevens writing for the majority. I think that's the language he used uh, was not substantially uh, burden a person's freedom of religion. So I need to go back and reread the case. I read it, but uh, I would need to reread it to be sure. But I think that's the language he used. But at, at any rate, we can explore it and read and study and. Yeah. Well, I think the question is, do we, do we feel compelled to uh, typically when we introduce introduce anything, we vote on it two weeks later? Um, do we want to consider that's pretty much just routine tradition. I don't think that that's a, a set in stone thing. But do we want to consider pushing this off and having this conversation so that everyone can get their their answers and opinions? Or do you want to move forward and, and put this on the agenda for two weeks? I think we need a little more time. Well, I'll make a motion to table. Can I make a motion to table both amendments at the same time? Well, why don't you do it separately? OK. We'll have to bring the other one back up. We missed that opportunity. I will add that I did ask uh, Dave Denton to be here tonight, but I, I think that his schedule wouldn't permit that. Right. So. We can actually, we can, we can table but, it next time if we decide that we didn't have enough time. How about that? I'd rather not table tonight. Let's wait. Okay. okay. I think that's better. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, if I, we decide I, we need more time in two weeks, we'll make a, we'll make a statement there because we didn't do it on the other one. So, so we, we could vote or we could table in two weeks. That gives us two weeks to study and talk to experts. I'm very interested in expert attorneys looking at the state language heard from one. I've uh, got a couple out, others out there. But I appreciate Richard getting 
getting this on the agenda, and I appreciate his passion about it. I think it's important. I've been in countries that did not have religious freedom. It's a scary place to be. My point would be, could we just get some more advance notice when it's an issue that may require research, talking with the city attorney? You know, I didn't have a chance to call him today. I don't know if all of you all did or not, but I, I feel like that is somewhat a waste of his time to talk to, I'll have to talk to all of us when he mm -hmm. could come here and talk to us all together. Yep. Yeah, so, I, I will invite him next time as well. You know, well, the city manager reached out. This morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as, um, I mean, the way our process works, if you're going <laughs> to amend an ordinance, it takes two readings. Mm -hmm. So the first one, uh, that's you read it. Anybody has any questions, you want to do research on it, you can do that. Come back the second time, you vote on it. So uh, you talk about notice. I mean, that's. I understand that, the process. Yeah, well, I'm just making sure I'm understanding what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think sending something out at 8.30 or whatever, the night before a meeting, and inserting it in the agenda just is not enough notice, so. Okay. So noted. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You ready to move on? Okay. Um, Commissioner McElroy. Oh, wait a minute. I lost my paper. Oh. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> Not too long. Okay. I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled An Ordinance Authorizing the Mayor to Execute Amendment Number 1 to the Engagement Agreement with Moss and Barnett for professional legal representation in the cable communications franchise renewal process and to handle other cable communication issues with an hourly rate of $510 per hour for the senior shareholder and $195 per hour for the paralegal. This ordinance is summarized as follows. The City of Paducah approves Amendment Number 1 to the engagement agreement with Moss and Barnett for legal representation related to the cable communications franchise renewal and authorizes the mayor to execute all documents related to same. This amendment updates the hourly rates for Moss and Barnett senior shareholders to $510 per hour and paralegal to $195 per hour, removes the not to exceed amount, and it updates the primary contact person for this project to be the public information officer. Second. Any discussion we heard from Pam last week about our last meeting about this? Any questions? Nope. All right. Call roll, please. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner McElroy. Aye. Commissioner Watkins. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Harless. Aye. All right. We're going to move into discussion. And tonight we have Dr. Anton Reese here with us and Lee Emmons to share with us more about the WKCTC Community Scholarship Program. Welcome. Oh, and the whole team is here as well. <laughs> Very great. Um, thank you so much. First of all, we do want to say thank you for allowing us to be here. And we want to thank you for your support of the Community Scholarship Program. And for those who may not be as familiar, just to briefly describe what that is, the Community Scholarship Program is a wonderful joint public-private partnership that uh, provides through donor support and through local government support the opportunity for our local high school graduates, Paducah, McCracken County, um, public and private schools and homeschool, to attend West Kentucky Community and Technical College and have their tuition paid through the CSP program. Uh, we are in our fifth year, have completed actually five years of the program. Planning began quite a bit before that but it's actually been in place for five years. In that time, nearly 1,200 students have gone through the Community Scholarship Program uh, with wonderful support that the college provides in faculty and staff, and you'll get to hear a little bit about that. But because the program is a, a last aid program, meaning if the student receives Pell Grant or other financial aid, all of that uh, goes to their account first. So actually slightly less than half of those nearly 1,200 students have received financial support through the CSP program. So uh, we're at, f I think, 549 students exactly who have received financial support through the Community Scholarship Program. Uh, I can't think that anyone here would disagree that uh, with my statement that a city government and a city that invests in education is truly a city that is investing in its future. So we thank you for investing in the future of this city and of our students. 
Mr. L.V. McGinty is chair of the Community Scholarship Program Advisory Board, and he would like to say a few words. Thank you. Mayor, Hi. commissioners, it's good to be here. It's been a long time since I've been behind this podium, so <laughs> in a different capacity. But I, <laughs> just to give you just a brief history is what they asked me to do, give you a brief history. Back in 2008, this idea came before the Rotary Club. George Shaw and Dwayne Tucker took it, and they sort of fed it out, ran it by the members, and we decided that that's something we ought to do. We ought to be able to make it available to people in Paducah and McCracken County to go to school if they wanted to and not stay out because they didn't have the money or they dropped out because they didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we sought to do. And one of the things that you realize, when we commit to the students, we commit to them when they start the ninth grade. So we've got four years to get the money for that group. And that was the first class. After about six years after we started in 08 to 14, then we had the money, we started the classes. So that's what we continue to do. And we can't promise the next class unless we have the money. And the city, the county, the people that committed when we first started the program, every one of them are still committed to the program. They're still making contributions, except for one person who passed away and one company that decided that they weren't doing the business that they thought they would be doing, so they had to drop out. But everybody else is in, and we've had other people come in and join us. So that's what we're trying to do, is educate, make the students better people in their school, make them want to attend, and getting their parents behind it, because if they've got a chance to get their child in school and not have to pay a bunch of money, then it's a good thing. So that's what we're trying to do for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and I apologize for the voice here. Um, the services for the community scholarship students, those support services begin a long time before they ever get on our campus. We actually start talking with those students in eighth grade, and last year when we did the WKY launch, that was to get those eighth graders excited about career opportunities in this area. So during that high, those high school years of ninth through 11th grade, we're visiting the classrooms, we're having those face-to-face -face conversations, and sometimes those difficult conversations conversations with those students who may not um, be meeting all the criteria to be eligible for the scholarship. And then during the senior year, we spend a great deal of time with those seniors in GEN 100, Introduction to College, which is a class that we teach on those camp high school campuses. And we waive that tuition with a presidential scholarship so those students do not have to pay tuition for that class. This class does help the students explore um, college and careers, but it also helps us to help them meet deadlines, financial aid deadlines, scholarship deadlines, admissions deadlines, no matter where they're choosing to go to college. Um, our financial aid staff then goes with us to those schools to help those students and parents navigate that FAFSA process that sometimes is very overwhelming to those individuals. And then in the spring, we're back at those schools to early enroll those students so that they have a schedule, a college schedule when they leave their high school as, as a graduating senior. Uh, the college felt strongly about this program and, and dedicated the resources to hire a completion coach. His name is Justin Hill. He's at the Tillman Award Ceremony tonight presenting scholarships, so that's why he's not here. But Justin tracks those students. Uh, he gets the grade reports. He gets the attendance reports. A professor, former Professor Watkins knows about that. And then if we need to track that student down, Justin is tracking that student down and having that conversation. And and we're also helping them refer them to tutoring or to mental health services or career services. So I could we could talk a lot tonight about everything, but I am going to introduce Dylan Howard. Dylan was the face of the CSP flyer for a couple of years. And then I was walking through our admissions office and Dylan is now the face of the transfer flyer to Murray State University <laughs> in education. So I'm gonna let Dylan share his story with you. Dylan. You are the literal poster child. <laughs> Hello, 
I've written a couple of uh, words for you all about my story through uh, my experiences at WKCTC. Um, my name is Dylan Howard. Uh, I've been asked to speak on behalf of the Community Scholarship Program at WKCTC. Um, it was only a short year ago that I graduated from the institution. Um, I was never a straight A student in high school. I think Ms. Lisa can probably attest to that. Um, <laughs> I didn't really care about academics, but um, that definitely changed uh, when I took my first classes at WKCTC. With the help and guidance of Dr. Lisa Stevenson and Mr. Justin Hill, I completed my Associates of Arts within two years with a 3.7 GPA. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the support and attention that the Community Scholarship Program gives students is unlike any university. With the help of the Community Scholarship Program, I easily transitioned to Murray State University, where I study middle school education with a concentration of social studies and language arts. Last week, I took my last junior year final, and I'm on track to graduate spring 2020. Since my time at WKCTC, I've become a member of the National Association of the I'm sorry, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, named the Ethnic Minority Representative of the Kentucky Education Association Aspiring Educators Executive Board, and awarded the Marvin Dotson, Carl Perkins, and KEA Ethnic Minority Scholarships. These accomplishments and scholarships could not have been achieved without the support and structure I received at WKCTC. I cannot speak highly enough on, be on behalf of this incredible program. It was at WKCTC that I took my first classes, um, attended my first lecture, and discovered my passion for teaching. Because of WKCTC, I will be able to serve the same community that supported me. Thank you. Wow, mm. congratulations on all of that. You think you're going to do better than that? Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you learn is speaking. You got to know when to that's, you should just drop the microphone. Class, that's where I got <laughs> Dylan continues growing and is a, uh, an incredible example, uh, clearly, of uh, the sea that this community has invested in the CSB program. Mm -hmm. And certainly, we want to produce many, 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 many more Dylans. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you had an opportunity to attend the CSB luncheon. You heard some other testimonies mm -hmm. from other students. Uh, so I think that um, by way of uh, the students and their measure of success, uh, again, is an important testament that this investment from the community is, is very, very, very key. I want to draw your attention to the chart on the wall just to reiterate this and certain to those watching today because it's a very important uh, question that needs to be asked. When all is said and done, if we want to use the terminology to return in, in, of, of, uh, on investment, <coughs> a core part of that then really is completion rates. So um, with intention, you will see that that second bar that says all public two years, so that's the national graduation rate for two-year colleges. It's 22 percent. Uh, some people are surprised at how low it is. Part of that is uh, community colleges, community technical colleges are open-door institutions, which means we take any and everybody, full range, right, including the valedictorians, salutatorians, et cetera. Um, we don't have dormitories, so we don't have that residence-type application. So one could argue that um, by nature of the students that we have, getting them to complete becomes a little bit more challenging. Very transient. People get jobs, which is good news. They'll drop out of school, get to work, and then, and then, then return at a different point. So 22% is a very important marker. You fast forward to the blue with intention. It was orange, but maybe change it. Um, you'll get that later on, but I kind of see connection. But you will note that WKCTC uh, is right at literally doubling the national rate. It's one of the reasons why we continue to be a top, uh, top 10, uh, four-time recognized institution. And you see our comparison then, even with our sister regionals, Western Kentucky University, and even my alma mater, Eastern Kentucky University. So as a community technical college, uh, we, you know, we are right there ahead of the pack uh, in terms of those completion rates. And then you see, as importantly, the CSB students from the 2014 graduates and the 2015 uh, right, right behind the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. So that's an incredible testament uh, to uh, the institution and the ways in which this program aligns and further expands and illustrates that piece. The visionaries of the program will continue to applaud uh, post-secondary attainment, getting students to complete beyond high school. Every year, my annual call to uh, Dr. Stevenson is, how are we looking in McCracken County? We still average just over 700 graduates. A third of those go to many of those four-year institutions that you see. A third come to us. 
And then there's a third that we continue to chase, right? A lot of movement back and forth. So we want to get more students, right? Obviously to remain in our area and because that is then tied into uh, workforce and economic development. Uh, when all is said and done, right? Jobs, jobs, jobs. So the CSP program uh, in summary uh, is an incredible seed that continues to uh, just, just reproduce and create great opportunities for us to get our best and brightest to remain within this uh, purchase area region, which is very, very, very critical uh, for the collective good and the return ultimately uh, on investment for our community. So we absolutely thank you for your support, continued support uh, of this program. And I'll be just thank you for this opportunity uh, to share uh, that good story of CSP. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you if so there are any questions, we'll be happy to see it. Any questions? Well, comment? I just want. Oh, Go who's ahead. That? Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment. I don't uh, travel very often, but when I do, I always talk about our community scholarship program. And uh, a few weeks ago, I had the uh, uh, honor of being one of the speakers at the Del Delta Regional Conference in in uh, in West Memphis. And uh, the, our section was education, workforce development. And uh, so when I mentioned the fact that uh, we have within our community an opportunity for a young person to go to the uh, first two years of college in our community college for no charge, Every, it, never, it never ceases to fail. Everybody look at me like I got three heads. <laughs> like, well, how did you guys, how, how, how do you do that? And everybody will, will explain that the way they do. This is the way I explain it. Everybody who's in the room will agree that education is, is a bridge builder. Education can be that equalizer. So everybody hand goes up. Quick, let's start right there uh, and let's move on what we all agree on. And our community did that and it continues to pay dividends uh, with the young man like, uh, like yourself. So uh, this is something that, uh, that we do. I'm proud that we participate. And uh, uh, it's, it's such an advantage for those young folks uh, once, they, once they laser in on what the opportunity uh, is and they take advantage of it. So you guys do a great job in not only receiving the money, but tutoring those kids, mentoring those kids, making sure that they complete uh, those two years. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I attended that luncheon and I heard two other stories and I was blown away. Amazing, amazing what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very familiar with the program. It's wonderful. <laughs> when you hear, you'll hear on TV, especially now during this season, people say all, you know, all students should have free tuition to community colleges. You may be hearing that. Mm -hmm. It's always like, we have that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our community, we mm -hmm. started that program mm -hmm. ourselves. You all did, mm -hmm. led that effort. And it's something that we should all be very proud of. So thank you. Thank you all. Well, Mr. President and gang, before you get out of here, I, yes, <laughs> I've got to say something. I appreciate y'all being here, uh, being here. Just great testimony. And Dylan, I'm finally glad to see somebody here about my height. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, great speech, and and uh, it's a it's a wonderful program. I was on the city commission before, and and uh, supported community scholarship program from its inception, and voted for it. And it's one of the one of the best votes I cast while I was on the city commission in the previous my previous life. I think it's a wonderful program. Financial reasons are the number one reason that students don't finish their degree or certificate. And so now, as Commissioner Wilson said, with just minimal requirements, any graduate of any school, public, private, religious, home school in Paducah and McCracken County can attend WKCTC free of charge for two years. That is incredible. That's great. And we are ahead of the curve. And, and uh, uh, I don't know of many other counties in Kentucky that, do, that can mm. claim that. but. I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate all your work, and I had the opportunity to serve on the board of the Community Scholarship Program, and and I cherish uh, having that opportunity. So again, appreciate you being here, and appreciate the great job that you're doing on that board and at the college. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have our budget workshop tomorrow night, so it sounds like you guys did the did a good job. <laughs> I think you hear lots of support from this commission. So thank you all for what you do. It matters a lot to us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All. Have a good evening. All right.
right, next up we have Glenn Anderson, who is the interim president and CEO of Greater Paducah Economic Development. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to update you on Greater Paducah Economic Development. We're excited. We're excited about what we're doing and where we're going. So I'd like to share just a little bit with you tonight. Start with a 10-year history. Uh, sometimes we forget where we've been or what we've done. And so I want to come back and say a little bit about that real quickly. In our 10-year history, we've touched, when I went back and looked and looked at our records, we've touched 22 companies in one way or another. Some that have located here some that have expanded here, some that we've worked with in retention, or in one way or another, we've touched 22 companies in the last 10 years. During that process, a thousand jobs were created. Sometimes we forget what was created, but a thousand jobs were created here in our community, and we're proud of that. Not near enough, but we're proud of what has taken place. We uh, have seen $100 million in investment in the community. Uh, Paducah McCracken County over the last 10 years. And so there has been some things that were accomplished but in the last seven months, we took a look at the challenges that we had. And uh, I've been there almost eight months. And we looked at the challenges and we started looking at the solutions that we thought were necessary for those challenges. The challenges, GPED uh, can't be all things to all people. We sort of collected a basket of things that we were asked to do over time. And, and it diluted the direction or the focus that we had, we believe. Our board was too large and our focus became divided over, the, over a period of time. This led to an undefined mission and it, it was a frustration within our organization, our partners and our investors as a part of that, as a part of our challenges. And so those were our challenges that we thought we needed to address and that's from listening to 70, 80, 90 stakeholders over a seven month period of time, talking with them, meeting with them, listening to what they said to us. Some of them were our investors, some of them were our board, some of them were those who had been on our board in the past, some were in the community at large, but listening to them, and that was what we identified as the challenges that we had. So what's the solution? We decided that the solution was to refine our mission and our structure. So when you look at the solutions, we first looked at our mission. And we defined our mission as Greater Paducah Economic Development is a public-private partnership that exists to proactively recruit and support companies that provide high-quality and high-paying jobs for our region, for our community and the region around us. In other words, we're looking for high-paying, high-quality jobs, and that's what we're here to do, and that's our focus going forward from this time forward to meet the challenges that we, we felt that we had. So that's where we are gonna land, that's where we're focused, and that's what we're gonna be about as we go forward into the future. By the way, I am the CEO, and I am the interim CEO and the chair of the board of GPED, so I speak for the board and on that behalf. So we have our mission, so what's our strategy? Our strategy is to develop opportunities, and we wanna market our assets that we have in our community. And I'll talk about those in a minute. So develop opportunities, and we wanna market our assets and remove constraints to, be, to being successful. That's what we wanna be about as far as our, our strategy. Our structure, we took a look at our structure. We said, how can we meet the challenges going forward with a better structure? So we looked at the CEO position, we looked at the working board position, we looked at investor council and, and committees. If I had an organizational chart, it might look something like this for the new structure that we developed. We created a working board. We had a 30 member board. Mm -hmm. We had a 10 member executive committee. That was a little bit weldy, a little bit large in our opinion, not as nimble as we thought it could be to do deals in the community that we wanted to do going forth. And so consensus developed uh, at our retreat in December and then coming forward to reduce the size of that board to create a nimble working board instead of having a 10 member executive committee and, a, and another 20 members on the board that received information but not not involved as much as they would like to have been. We created a working board that's 11 members. Um, we also have a partnering organizations that we're gonna work with. The Chamber, 
the college that was here just a minute ago, Murray State University, University of Kentucky Engineering School. So the colleges in our community, not only them, but the K through 12 schools in, in Paducah, McCracken County, working with them to create a pipeline of employees for the employers that we have in our community. We've done that in two or three different sectors over the last couple of years. We want to work with, uh, in addition to that, workforce development groups, uh, Marianne Metlock and her group, the chamber. We want to work in different kinds of ways in partnership. We also created in our new bylaws an investor council. An investor council is defined by all of those, public and private, that invest into greater Paducah economic development to help us bring jobs in the community are part of the investor council. So the city of Paducah is one of those. And that investor council going forward will be the council that will elect our board members. We have a transition board that was put into place, uh, but starting next year, we have staggered terms. That investor council will come together, have a slate of the open Open seats and be able to nominate from the floor and, and elect those that go onto the board for GPDC in the future. From that council will also draw resources of information and knowledge and skill sets to help us be successful. So we want to involve the investor council. We'll meet with them at least once a quarter and with them annually as a part of our public-private partnership of GPDC. From them, we'll uh, form committees. Sometimes they'll be standing committees. Sometimes they'll be task committees for specific tasks, and then they'll dissolve. We'll also have individuals from the community that may have skill sets that will work with us on committees to help us be successful. And then last, we want to hire a new CEO, permanent CEO, that will develop staff, be, work with the staff to go and recruit high-quality, high-paying jobs, which is our focus. But working with those individuals, working with our partners that will take important pieces of what's necessary to do economic development, we think we can be successful and that's the organization that we developed uh, last April when our board, uh, 30 members was dissolved and our new board, 10 members plus a past chair was created. Talking about our CEO and staff, we hope to have a new CEO announced uh, next month. Uh, we're, working, we're working toward that. Uh, the month of June, where we focused on recruiting prime movers. Prime movers is a, a term for industries or businesses that come into the community and they create momentum around them, either for the existing businesses that we have in the community or businesses they will draw to our community because they are that type of business. The CEO will develop goals and a plan for industry recruitment and expansion. And then we as a board will develop benchmarks for accountability to execute on those goals and plans. We felt like that was a piece that was missing in the past. We wanted to address that, not only hold ourselves accountable to the goals that we set forth, but the staff that works for us, the CEO that's gonna lead, uh, lead the effort in that, in that direction. The working board is created to be a right team to accomplish our goals a nimble team that can come together and work, not like a civic club, but there'll be times they'll come together and put lots of hours in to help the CEO, the staff be successful, bringing their skill sets to bear. So they'll be the right team, the nimble team, and, and it has been referred to as maybe the deal-making team is our, is our goal with, with our working board. Investor Council, I've spoken to that. That's our stakeholders, that is our investors in GPDC because we're an investment group. All of our funds come from our public and private investors, public being the city of Paducah and McCracken County and private being all of our private companies in the community or individuals in the community that, that give money each year to uh, the GPDC to allow us to operate, function, develop, market, and sell the community for jobs because when it comes right down to it, it is for jobs. The committees will help this focused effort. We'll, we'll bring individuals in, skill sets in, in place so that we can achieve the goals, work toward the goals that we set in place. Partnerships, we want to develop, we want to execute and, and, and continue to develop, continue to enhance our partnerships. Local partnerships is with the chamber, the colleges that I mentioned already, uh, the school systems, 
uh, our businesses in the community, workforce development. And then regionally, we want to work with economic development leaders, professionals in the counties around us to be regional outlook, regional support, and, and root them on, compete, but also work with them to, to, to lift the region as a whole, because if the region is lifted, we also we also develop. So we want to see them win as well. And then we want to continue to enhance our relationship with the state, the Cabinet for Economic Development. We have a good relationship with them now. We've had great support from them. We've had some great looks from them that's come and look at our community. And so I can tell you that that relationship is, is good today. And I think you could ask them individually and they would tell you the same thing. So those are the partnerships that we want to continue to work with and collaborate because it takes all of those for economic development. So our current assets that we're going to market is our triple rail site, which sometimes referred to as our Ohio River triple rail site, which has got triple rails and it can connect to two more standard one rails uh, in the country. We've got river access there. We've got them both. And, and now seems to be a time where we're, we're having some enthusiasm to look at that site. We're, we're having a state that says we're the only site in this state that has that kind of appeal, mm -hmm. has rail and river. Got other sites, but not one like that. And so they're aware of us. They are helping us to market that site. And we expect that we're going to have some success with that in the coming months and, and year or so. We got the Commerce Park, sometimes referred to the Information Age Park. We still got at least 20 sites out there that we're going to get more aggressive in marketing those sites uh, for the Commerce Commerce Park. And then we have the I-24 Park that's located near Exit uh, 3 on Interstate 24. We've got about 100 acres left in it. Uh, we've got a good 47-acre piece, and then we've got some smaller pieces, and we're going to work with that. So those are the parks we're going to market, and that's just kind of an overview of where we've been, where we're going. We're excited. We think as a team, the city of Paducah, McCracken County, uh, GPED, and our partners, that we can be successful in Paducah-McCracken County. We believe we can win. We believe we get the right person in here to help us go and recruit. We're doing everything now that's required of us and have been doing that the last seven or eight months, but the piece that's missing is going out and initiating and recruiting, mm -hmm. and so we're in the process or in the system to, uh, to seek a person to fill that role and lead the organization as the president and CEO. So that gives you an overview of who we are, what we're doing, uh, the direction we believe we're going, and we believe we can be successful. We believe we do that as being a team, working together. So if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to answer those, but appreciate the opportunity to come and especially share with the commission where we are, where we're going, and where we believe we can end up being. Thank you. Thank you. Some questions? Well, I Commissioner Watkins, no, I, go ahead. I was just going to make a little statement. I, uh, the most important decision GPE did will make is to hire a new president, CEO, and you're getting ready to make that decision. And our community is depending on your board to make the right decision. We are starved for new jobs, and we're being beat by so many other communities about the same size. Paducah's gone from fifth largest to 17th largest city in Kentucky, and we're sliding backwards. Uh, and so it's important that we hire the right person. I hope we get it right this time. Thank you for your hard, hard work and your commitment to the board. And you're doing a great job, Lynn, and we appreciate GPED. And I hope y'all make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. We, are, we want to do the right thing for the right reason. Sometimes doing the right, right thing for the right reason uh, is the hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I think, will do the hard thing that needs to be done. Um, I can't predict what that is today, but I think that, that's our attitude, do the right thing for the right reason. We don't get it right, the, right in this process. We'll turn around and continue a process to find that right person. So uh, I just tell you that that's the heart of who, what we're trying to do and where we're going, do the right thing for the right reason. I thank you so much for that, and we are counting on you, and we also want you all to know we're doing everything we can to make Paducah better, too. We're working hard on, on customer service, on athletic complexes, and, and making our city the best city in the world. Thank you. The audience may not know, but you all know that many times site selectors come into our community 
and when they actually come for an official visit, if they actually come for an official visit, it's because they've already been here and they've had a good experience and they like what they see. So everyone in the community sells our community in one way or another, whether that's the waitress in the restaurant, that's the person behind the counter in the hotel, or that's the person in a shop or a store or a place that they might come. So many times they come to the community before they ever contact us and they look at us. And so you having a, an environment that's mm -hmm. welcoming, an environment that's, uh, that's a good host, an environment that says we want your business is important because it takes all of that for, to have success. So thank you. Yeah, I'd like to applaud you guys for scaling that board down from 30 people. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I told a guy the other day, I said, that's like my mom, my grandmother, and my aunt in the kitchen trying to decide what goes in the roast, and you got a table full of people out here and we're hungry. Can we get that done? It's gonna take a minute. Uh, so scaling that down to 10, uh, I think you use the word nimble, uh, I, can, I can see that. So uh, um, you guys are on the right track, and I, I thank you for your efforts. I appreciate that. Thank I you. Was, I, I was just gonna say thank you for stepping in at a time yes, when our community exactly. needed you. Mm -hmm. You were appreciate that. enjoying retirement, and thank you for stepping in. <laughs> yes. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also thank the, the 20 board members that are no, are the board members that are no longer board members. Mm -hmm. They came together in April, and in a resolution, they did several things. They approved new bylaws. They approved update to their articles. Uh, the by bylaws created what I sh shared with you a few minutes mm -hmm. ago. But at the same time, they also fired themselves. <laughs> All 30 of them did, didn't they, Mayor? Mm -hmm. And so they executed a resolution that f basically depopulated that board, right. removed themselves from the board, and then they passed in that resolution a slate that repopulated the board with many of them, most of them not on the board. So they stepped aside to do the right thing mm. after review, and so I have to applaud them for what they did. That's not, that's not done every day. Right. Absolutely. And we had some very uh, very smart, good people in our community that did that. So you have to applaud them for doing that, trying to do the right thing for the right reason, which is not easy to do. So I thank them for doing that. Well, I have to take my opportunity because I see you all the time as the city's representative on the GPED board and thank you publicly. Mm -hmm. I know I've thanked thank you. you a lot. And I also want to say thank you to the board members. You're right. This was not an easy thing to do for a community that has been doing it the same way for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And for a community to step up and say, we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results was a big deal. But you really did come in as a leader and help us get there. So thank you for your service thank first you, and foremost it. thank you yep appreciate thank you, you being here tonight mm -hmm. yes. thank you we'll see you more often hopefully hopefully <laughs> uh, we did make a commitment so the commission knows to be here quarterly uh, we'll be here more often if the circumstances dictate that but the reason to start tonight was to start that quarterly process so that you as a commission who are not on the board have an opportunity to know what we're doing, what's happening behind the scenes. That's a part of the accountability piece that we want to build in for ourselves to our community. So that's why I'm here tonight, and that's, that's the execution of the plan that we said we would do. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, comments from the city manager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just uh, all revolves around one word, budget. <laughs> so, so tomorrow is the budget workshop. I invite the, uh, of course, the public to attend and uh, look forward to uh, beginning at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon in this same chambers. And uh, we'll just go as, as fast or as slow as the uh, Board of Commissioners want to go. <laughs> no dinner. Provided. No dinner. Eat before you come. Eat, eat before you come. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any comments from the commissioners tonight? I would just add that this is National Skilled Nursing Home Week, and I went to a balloon send-off at Stone Creek, and uh, the encouragement there was to remember our elderly that are dependent on those institutions and stop by one of them, visit someone you know that's in a nursing home and encourage them. Um, I think that's really important, and they do a, we have great skilled facilities in our, our community. I think that's wonderful. Thank you for representing mm -hmm. us. Glad to. Really appreciate that. My a lot. first job was in a nursing home. <laughs> That's great. Full circle. Full I've been circle. there. <laughs> You've been there. That's rough. <laughs> it is rough. Yeah. It's not easy work. That's right. Yeah, I have. I have something. Um, I wasn't going to say anything about what I'm getting ready to say, talk about. But I had um, a couple of guys ask me um, why I 
was so um, uh, intentional on the the resolution that keeps coming up and coming up and coming up, and and we had a conversation, and it, it got a little got a little heated, but you know we've known each other for about forty years, so we talked about it, and uh, I said I'll tell you what, let let me explain it to you. So I'm going to take this moment just to go over some highlights real quick uh, of why I have taken the stand that I have uh, with regards to the resolution that we passed uh, back. Uh, in 2017 or 2016. Um, uh, 2017, um, and this is a phrase that I was not familiar with at all, that chaos creates change. I, I didn't know what, what that was or where that came from, but I looked it up and it's actually a strategy that some groups use. So I'm like, okay, um, not exactly sure where that goes, um, but uh, I'm gonna use that as a point of reference. Uh, November 26, real quick. Um, the Paducah Sun uh, reported that uh, one of our previous uh, commissioners approached a, a, a citizen on the street during the Veterans Day Parade uh, looking at what they were looking at, uh, the, the Confederate flag coming down Broadway. Um, got commented on it, didn't make him feel real good. Uh, the, the commissioner said, well, then candidate, you can, this is what you should do. You should go to the city and uh, express your, your feelings. So that happened. Uh, didn't like what they were saying. That was the flag coming down Broadway. Okay, that's the process that we have. That's the system that we have. No problem with that. Um, the, uh, uh, we had a, at the time we had a Veterans Day committee. Their job was to put together the parade. So they, they put that together. I might add that prior to 2016, that this particular group had participated for six straight years, not a problem. So what happened? Okay, so uh, all of a sudden you, you're, not, you're not welcome in the parade anymore with our conversation. No conversation, you just can't do it. Um, and I think it's been my, it's been my experience that when you have a, a situation like that, that it's, uh, it's important to sit down across the table and talk to uh, the person that uh, is all of a sudden, you're not welcome. So moving on. So we have um, uh, some of the veterans on that committee uh, felt that they were misled into putting together a letter to the commission uh, to uh, quite frankly, keep this group from participating. Now let's rest our hat there a minute. To keep this group from participating in a public event. Now that type of language sounds very familiar to me, coming from where I came from. But we'll rest, that, we'll rest our hat there for a second. Moving forward, moving forward, 2017, May 2nd, uh, May 21st, the Paducah Sun quote said, while the resolution language does not specifically cite Confederate flags or floats, it would prevent them from being featured in future vet Veterans Day Parade. That year, they did not participate. Later on, they were, they were banned, did not participate, did not receive an application in the mail like previous years. Um, Fast forward, moving forward, a, we had a veteran, elderly veteran, that uh, fought in the Vietnam War, that fought for the right to choose the, the rights that we have every day. Uh, he was, was told by, by the city, uh, you wouldn't be allowed to carry your state flag. Um, the very flag that he, he, he fought for, fought under, from being from Mississippi, um, wasn't allowed. As a matter of fact, if you do that, uh, you'll be arrested. Well, he wasn't arrested. Um, but that, 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 that kind of hits my heart because he's no longer with us. And he didn't get, he didn't get that chance to exercise that right. So as we, as we move forward, um, why do I feel the way I feel about that amendment, that resolution? Because I remember a time growing up in the South where resolutions like that they were pretty common, but they didn't read about the Sons of Confederate Veterans. They read about black people. We're gonna pass this resolution, and some of them became law, that even though it's 98 degrees on an August afternoon, you can't come to this pool, why? 
Why can't I get in the pool? Well, I don't, your look offends me. I don't like uh, the way you look. I don't want you in the pool with my white brothers and sisters. You're not allowed. Black people, well, I want to go shopping. Well, you can't shop in this store. Why is that? Because I don't like the way you look. So you can't shop here. So I will never, ever support any type of resolution, ordinance, municipal order that is dripping with that type of bigotry. I can't do it. I will not do it. This is the last time that I talk about this situation. But those guys that I talked to today, I told them to watch, and I will explain exactly why. It's not that I'm in love with the Confederate flag. That's not it at all. But we have, we live in a country where if I don't like what I'm looking at, I can turn away. I don't have to look at it. I don't have to engage it. That's the country we live in, and that's the country I love. And as crazy as things seems to be now, you never see a whole lot of, a boatload of people leaving the United States. There's a reason for that. Because if you have an idea, James Brown had a line in one of his songs, Living for America. He said, th it said this, you may not be looking for the promised land, but you might find it anyway. That's the country we live in, and that's why when we take that oath to defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I take that serious, and uh, that's why I've acted I've spoken out against that the way I have. And I hope for anybody that was guessing why I've taken the stance that I've taken, I hope that clears it up. I have a question for you. Uh, you stated that you would never support anything that is dripping with that kind of bigotry. How did you vote for the fairness ordinance that was introduced last year? I didn't vote for it. So are you saying that your vote no was your vote? My vote was for what? What are you suggesting? You said you would never support a move that represents that kind of bigotry. And you voted against protecting a certain group of people last year. <laughs> we just had that conversation, Mayor. The group of people you're talking to are already protected. Do we not have a constitution of the United States? Are we talking about individual people? The Constitution of the United States was in place during the time you're speaking of in the mm -hmm. 1950s and 60s, mm -hmm. and it didn't protect. We had to get down and dirty, as you know, on local and state levels to change laws to protect people. Right, and that's the beauty of this country. It is, absolutely. So that's why when you start talking about I don't want to get into that removing stuff. It's like, no, leave it there because it reminds us of where we were and where we are right now. And the majority of the people that live in this community would never intentionally discriminate against anybody. I agree with you. Time and time again, we come to the forefront and we're there for each other. But there's a narrative that's floating around that ha would have you think that that's not the case. But those folks that speak like that, they're not the majority. Mm. That's true. I agree with you. Absolutely. Anyone else have any comment in response? Sure, I'd be happy to change the subject okay. and just talk about um, I had the opportunity to represent the city at an Energy Communities Alliance a meeting in D.C. I mentioned that because I hated missing the uh, opening, yeah. grand opening of City Hall. But um, Judge Clymer and I went, and it was a very informative meeting. The ECA is made up of communities that have a DOE facility in, in their community. And uh, all of them have closed. And so it was very interesting to hear what they're doing in their communities to um, protect their citizens to make sure that the cleanup is happening as it is. I mean, that's one of our largest employers are project, projected to be here until 2065, but it's still very important that we know what's going on out there and the opportunities. And here in Glenn, you know, it's, it's very important that we also move forward with reindustrialization of that site so that we can um, pr 
perhaps get some new companies in there that would be on that property as well. Then we have a highly skilled workforce there, and um, we want to make sure that we continue to move forward with that. So I hope that the city and the county are going to be coming members of ECA. They let us come this time without being an official member. I know that they would like for us to be a member, and I've talked to Jim about it for the budgeting process. So um, it was very, very informative. Also, I just wanted to mention, I did attend on Saturday the Creative Symposium, and I want to congratulate Tamara and her staff on that. It was very well done. And I, I did kid her and say at one point, I thought, oh, I didn't want to give up a Saturday. But I didn't feel like I gave up a Saturday at all. I felt like I gained so much knowledge uh, at that event. I heard a lot of great speakers. Of course, we had Randy Cohen from Americans for the Arts that came in from D.C. to be here with us and to speak. We had a lot of speakers from the state. I have to say my favorite was the one from Berea College. She did such a really wonderful presentation. I went up to her and talked to her later about just coming here and doing some conferences on other subjects as well, and she does that in other communities. So you may be seeing her come in later, and another speaker that might come here to um, like an arts, a salute to our arts organization. So it was very well done. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you to the staff, and thank you, Jim. It was a, a very, it was just a very encouraging, uplifting day. Really, it was. Well, I'd like to add to that because um, I remember us having a conversation about the arts um, during our strategic planning retreat back in January and I was really proud actually of the evolution that that part of our strategic plan took and if you remember we changed it very specifically away from a generic enhancing arts and culture right. to focusing on creative industries mm -hmm. and that's what I felt like Saturday was about it, it yes. wasn't about art that you hang on the wall and, and necessarily you know gaze at it was about how do you help a creative community leverage that into entrepreneurship into business opportunities um, into recruiting business to your community so I just want to say I, our staff listened <laughs> and I'm so thankful that you all responded the way that you did and created that event it was very much tied into economic development mm -hmm. absolutely yep anyone else all right I have to say we have two public comments tonight um, and one of them, there's this part of it you say is the subject you wish to speak on. And one of them says love, and the other one says respect. So what a great way to end an evening. Uh, I'm going to ask Victoria Terra to come up first um, from North 7th Street. What a long, wonderful evening. <laughs> I've been coming now since December to all the commissioners meetings, and this one was jam packed. So um, I'd like to address, because I won't be able to be here for the next meeting, the, uh, the amendments to the fairness ordinance. And I am a very religious person. And as a Unitarian Universalist, it is part of my doctrine that I honor everyone's path to the divine. These are really difficult conversations for our community to honor everybody. How do we honor everybody? And I so admire you, Mayor, so very, very much because you have these conversations. And I love the way that you approach them and you relish you. them. If we allow people's religion to stop us from being human, to allow people to dis discriminate, I think I'm not on board with that. And I just want to be, I just want to say it to you guys. There are two very motivating forces, two really basic motivating forces that drive humans, fear and love. Let's choose love. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beeler, can you guess hers was, hers was love and yours is respect? Well, we'll start out with a little of that. Okay, sounds Mayor great. Mayor Harless, we both finally it. agreed on something. 
We erected two billboards. Paducah went nuts. People went putting signs all over, put them underneath the billboard. A young lady from WPSD asked me what I felt about it. I said, it's wonderful. It's people exercising their First Amendment rights. And I heard you on TV say the same thing. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot about the Constitution tonight, Richard. Thank you. And by the way, we're not colluding. Um, we the people, not these people, not those people, not the other people. We wonder where we fall into this. Uh, Ms. Wilson, we've become pretty good friends, I hope. But I, I have a quote that you said it was discussed and debated. Truth of the matter is, we was never brought into the conversation. September 26, 2018, Ms. Holland sat right there and said in this chamber that she apologized that we weren't brought in. Had we been brought, this well, we wouldn't be where we're at today because we could have we could have done a many things, and I've said that in here a million times. Uh, it's the same night, Miss Harless, you said that uh, you didn't see where I was given anything. I, I presented you all a proposal that completely eliminated the SCV from the parade, which eliminates the flags. And by the way, after what I heard tonight, if you all have researched our organization down in Florida, we have guys down there that have battle flags that are rainbow. Now, if we bring them up here and put them in a parade, are we going to be accepted with those? I mean, I, I'm not throwing anything out there, and I'm not being ugly. I don't want to be ugly. I want to get this resolution done. I want to go on about my life. I've got other things to do. But I feel like this resolution, as long as it's out there, it's going to be there. And there's no reason for it to be there. We've done proven a million times, and we know it can be done because, Mr. Watkins, me and you had a conversation. And you said you could help me rescind that resolution, but then you throw it in if I'd fly a U.S. flag at the park. It's a Confederate park. I can't do that. Uh, it's not my position to negotiate. The only thing I want to do is see the resolution done. It's not hard. And I don't know why y'all can't do away with this resolution. We've done told you we wouldn't be in your parade. We give you the, we give you the proposal to put in your parade permit, and we wouldn't apply for it anyhow. It's pretty simple. Just eliminate it, and we're done. And why can't you eliminate it? I mean, what's it, what purpose is it serving? You've got guys that we, we're not going to cause you no trouble. We're not going to cause the veterans. Most of these men right here are Vietnam veterans. They're not going to cause the veterans problems. We're not, we're not against the NAACP. We're not against the LBGTQ. By the way, you saw us downtown in our uniforms, and everybody loved it. We had a big time in front of your place, as a matter of fact. Got our pictures took, and we always get our pictures took. We open up the museum for everybody. We try to be a part of the community. We don't want to be against people, and we don't want people against us. By the way, you had a you had a thing tonight about bulletproof vest. I had to acquire one. After the billboards, uh, it was suggested that people call Lamar Science Corporation. I got a call from Lamar. It was vicious, disrespectful, and violent. And I have received threats, bodily threats. So I'm protecting myself. Uh, social media, if you go to WPSD and you look it up, there were 750 plus comments. One out of every 40 was positive, was a negative. The rest of them are all positive. You go to the McCracken County Democratic website, and I have never seen such stuff in my life. And they had to actually put a put a statement up there to please be kind because the people you're calling simply work here. They don't make decisions. They not only called them, they called the local office and the little girl that sells signs, they called her. I got this phone call. I basically, I don't know what else to tell y'all. I want this over with. I want it done, and I don't know how to do it. And I've invited Mr. Cleary to have a conversation with me. Never happened. I've invited y'all to step in that back room and sit down and do what we're doing here. Never happened. I get the feeling there's some, what's the word used? Narrative? There's a narrative. Or somebody's got something going on that they can't do it. Who, who is saying that this can't be done? Ms. Horace, me and you, like you said, we've known each other a long time. I don't dislike you. I don't like, dislike anybody. And I hate seeing people say bad things about y'all on the Internet. It's worth throwing the Internet away. Unfortunately, people get their information there, and some of it's not right. Uh, being Mr. Abraham, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. Uh, you've been called a lot of things. We just call you respectful. Thank you all. Thank you.
All right, I don't see. Glenn didn't. Guys, we are maintaining business here. Glenn's still here. Great. All right, we're going to have a motion to go into executive session. I got it. Okay, and who has that motion? Have Mr. It. Abraham? I move that the board go into closed session for discussion of matters pertaining to the following topics. A specific proposal by a business entity for a public discussion of the subject matter would jeopardize the location, retention, expansion, or upgrading of a business entity as permitted by KRS 61.8101G. Second. Roll call, please. <laughs> Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner McElroy? Aye. Commissioner Watkins? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Harless? Aye. And our meeting is actually downstairs where the Human Rights Office right. used to be. Downstairs in the corner. Oh. Yes. Right? Yep. And there's a new conference room down there. With that huge table. That huge, huge table. table. That huge yeah. table.